guys, welcome back to Medical Coding with Blue. Today's episode is all about what happens in a medical coder's audit. If you are brand new to my channel, welcome. I am Blue, I'm a medical coder. Okay guys, so if you are a medical coder, you will get audited. <laughs> and it, what is an audit? An audit is basically a double check of the records that you are coding to make sure that you are applying the correct diagnosis codes, procedure codes, modifiers, and any of those things. It's just to make sure that everything is correct and going smooth, that you didn't miss anything, that you're not miscoding something, or you're not unbundling something. I got this um, comment from a viewer, and as you know, my episodes are inspired by you all the viewers, so I will read the comment and then we'll get into it. So, here we go. So the viewer says, thank you for your helpful advice and tips. I was just wondering, as a new coder, does anyone double check my work to make sure that I don't make mistakes? So it's different at most places. I mean, every place they're gonna have their own rules and standards and things like that. But I would just share my experience and what happened with me, right? I do get audited. <laughs> um, and when I worked for a level one trauma hospital a few years ago, uh, th their audit process was a little unique. So when I first got hired on, of course, I took the assessment test to make sure that I was competent enough to get the job. So I passed the assessment test, I had the interview, interview went great, and I got offered the job. Cool. So then, um, they're not just going to turn me loose because this is all brand new to me. It was a new system, new electronic health record system I was working with. They have their own different type of way of doing things and things like that. So this was a lot of level one traumas. So these are like the worst of the worst of the worst. And these were very detailed coding situations. So what happened was um, you had to get 100 records and you had to code above 95.5%, whatever it was, that, that was the average that you had to reach. So that what they would do is they would give you 10 records at a time and you had to pass each one of those 10 records at 95% and above before you can get the next batch of records. And this went on all the way until you hit 100 records. And so uh, as I'm going through there and I'm, and I'm coding and I'm turning them in, um, usually it is a lead medical coder or it is an auditor who will do it or it is your supervisor that will do it. Well, this organization had a separate auditing department. So that auditor um, would double check my records and make sure that every, they agreed with everything. <laughs> and then if it was okay, then they would turn it back over to me and I could just final them. I could just complete the, the, the coding process so that the billers could get it. Well, if there was a problem and the auditor didn't agree with my codes, then she was supposed to cite her, and this is supposed to happen every single time you get audited. If you are being told that your codes are incorrect for whatever reason, they need to come up with a reputable reference and resource that supports their argument. They can't just say, well, auditor stands by their word. I've had that happen to me uh, before too. And I'm like, <laughs> I don't know what you think this is, but let me give you a little bit of education. So that's the thing when it comes to coding. And you know, even if you're a brand new coder, you still have to stand up for what's correct. And they still have to be able, a good auditor will explain to you the difference and, and what, why they, you should code what they're selecting and they should make it to where you understand because you, they have a reputable reference and resource. It didn't just code come from we love to code.com. I don't know if there is a website called we love to code.com, but I'm just saying it can't come off of some blog. It can't come off of some you know, oh, we do it this way here at our facility like this. It has to come from CPT assistant, coding clinic, the Merck manual, something that is reputable. Okay. So that was that whole thing. But, um, I, I did, I did fairly well. Obviously I was able to get through all the records and I was able to be turned loose after the 100 and then I could just code. And so a lot of the things that, um, were coming back were, because I'm very proficient when it comes to injury coding. So the auditor had to really learn a lot from what I was telling them and things like that. Cause I was actually showing them coding clinic and CPT assistant and all these things so that they knew that I'm not just somebody with no experience who doesn't understand what they're doing. I, I know what I'm doing, 
you know, this is what I do. So, you know, <laughs> it was a very interesting time. But when it comes to when you are audited, you have to have the ability to be able to refute an error. Okay. You have to be able to stand up for yourself and say, well, this is why I got this. Because what happens is they will grade your work and then they will, you know, give you the spreadsheet back and tell you um, what they found, what were their findings. Yes, everything was good. Or no, you should have coded this code instead of this code, or you were missing this code, this code. And if you see some that, okay, well, yeah, they caught me that I was wrong. So all you have to do is just go back and change it and correct it and everything's okay. Uh, but that's when you are doing what is called a pre-bill, okay? And that's what they called it, was a pre-bill. Because they weren't billing anything until somebody had double-checked me. You know, until that process went and everything was all hammered out. Then I could, you know, submit, you know, the claim to the billing people and, and it goes from there. But that's usually kind of what happens when you very first start. They will double-check your work to make sure that you are coding correctly, you're not missing anything, you're adding modifiers where they belong, you're coding the correct side, you know, and those are the things that they're looking at. The sequencing, they want to make sure the sequencing is correct too. So they're looking at all of those things when you're being audited. And so when you get into just regular work, what they do is you, when you start to go on regular production coding, which what that means is when you're in production coding, this means that you've come out of that pre-bill and that when you are submitting the completed encounters or whatever you're doing, when you've completed that task, it's going off to wherever it goes to the billers and things like that. So, or maybe you're the one who's doing it, I don't know. <laughs> but again, billers and coders are different and I've never had to bill. My stuff always goes off to the billers. And so that's the way that it's always been with every place that I've ever worked. So when um, you are in regular production coding, all of the records that you are coding, all the encounters, everything that you touch is getting electronically logged, everything. It has a timestamp for when you touched it, how long you were in that record, what page you were on, and it gives down to the seconds <laughs> that you were in that record. And so what they do with that is they can see, obviously, if you are looking at records that you're not supposed to, which they do run those audits from time to time to make sure that everybody's complying with what they're supposed to be doing. And if they see something suspicious, obviously, that's when they start to look further. Uh, but that's another thing for another time. Uh, but when it comes to these records, what they will do when they're doing an audit for the coders to uh, grade for their accuracy, once a month, they will take either the last month uh, records and they will take all the records that you did and they will randomly pick out uh, however many they say that they're going to audit for. Now, I have been audited with as little as 15 records. Now, 15 records is a very tiny, minute um, number of records compared to what I can code in a month. So I don't think that it's fair when the record count is that low. I really do think it needs to be at 25 and 30, 30 preferably, uh, because that way it's a little bit more fair. Because if on 15 records, if you make one mistake, you know, you can blow your whole um, uh, accuracy and that's not right. And so because with a smaller number of records, every single diagnosis code, procedure code, modifier, all of those things, every single one of them counts. And so you never want to get to a place where they have such a low number. Um, but, you know, it really all depends on how they manage their things. Because some places I've heard that they take three months and they'll do 50 and then they'll say, okay, well, here's the coder's accuracy standard uh, and this is what they came out with. And so what they do is they look at that record and they code it out themselves. This is what they usually do. Um, so the auditor will code it out themselves, all of the codes that they deem are correct versus the codes that you coded. If they don't match up or if the auditor thinks that you coded it incorrectly, all of those errors are wrong. 
And so what they'll do is they'll put it on their findings. This is what you should code because of this reason, this reason, this reason. And then you will get the results back. Sometimes your supervisor will step in and, and uh, advocate for you. I don't really believe in that. I believe if you're going to tell me that I did something wrong, you need to tell me. You don't need to tell my supervisor. You, you got to tell me because I'm the one who's got to fix it. Okay. I don't just fix things because somebody tells me to correct this and do it this way because I said so. No, I've never been this way. And it's not because, oh, you're stubborn and hard headed. No, it has everything to do with ethical coding. If that um, auditor or even that supervisor doesn't have the same level of experience as you, it can be a problem, especially when you're sitting there coding and they're saying that you should be coding it this other way and that way may or may not be correct. Everybody has to make sure that we double check everybody. Even the auditors have to be double checked, okay? So that's why I say, if you know that you did it correctly, then bring your references and your resources so that way you can explain yourself and they can either reverse the um, the error or you know they'll work it out whatever way that they have to with you. Uh, but if you do that, then of course you'll, if you make an error and you know it's legitimate, then you correct the error and everything's fine. If you find that you were correct and you tell the auditor and they find that you were correct, then the error goes away. And that's how they keep track of your accuracy. So they'll record once you agree, both parties agree on the, the audits. Okay, well, I agree <laughs> that, yes, I made this error or, you know, uh, that this was correct and, you know, the error, the error rate went back to normal. Um, then they record those numbers. And so you'll have a category usually for your diagnosis coding, one for your procedure coding, one for like modifiers and things like that. So, um, and then like, Hicks picks your durable medical equipment and things like that. So they'll break down all of those and then they'll record those percentages that you got correct. And then they'll do the, the same thing the next month. They'll pull however many records they're supposed to. Hopefully they do 25 or 30 <laughs> and they audit and then you get your results and then you either correct it or you, you know, tell them, Hey, this is the reason why. Now, a lot of people will freak out and say, well, I did really bad on the audits. They're going to fire me. I didn't, I didn't meet my uh, accuracy standard. Say your accuracy standard is 95%, but that month you pulled in at 85% and you're like, oh my gosh, they're going to fire me. Don't panic. Everybody has a month or so where they're off. Everybody, it happens to everybody. And sometimes it's not even the coder's fault. Sometimes it happens with the system. Sometimes codes will not transfer over or something happens or maybe there's an update and and maybe it didn't quite catch or something like that whatever sometimes it's mechanical and it's just the the system itself or it's technical not mechanical it's technical um, and it's not your own fault right um, and sometimes it is but if that's the case if it is your fault oh man i missed that or i didn't really understand that or i didn't know that until my auditor told me so now from now on, I've been doing it correctly, but back then when they're auditing me, I wasn't doing that and I got an 85%. So if you get an 85%, don't think that they're going to fire you. It is very difficult <laughs> to find coders and not only that, to find competent coders that can actually do the work and who actually want to do the work and actually want to fulfill all the requirements of that particular organization's positions of coders. Okay. Because sometimes it's that, um, it's different with every facility and sometimes that you are coding for one clinic, or sometimes you are just going from clinic to clinic. You're basically like a Rover and you don't really stay with one clinic, but you're actually coding for a bunch of different clinics. So it really all depends. And then you have to meet your productivity and then you're trying to meet accuracy. And again, if you, hit a low month and you say you hit 85 so you go back and you correct and you do all those things then the next month you go back up to 90 percent okay you're not quite at 95 percent but you're at 90 percent so you're improving then you have nothing to worry about because you're actually going up okay so it's not anything to be panicked over the only time you should panic is if you're doing something really egregious and you keep making mistakes you keep making errors you're your accuracy is going lower and lower every single month. 
then that is something to worry about because yeah, there's something going on. Uh, you're either not listening to the auditor or um, you are intentionally miscoding because you feel like it. And I mean, that's just not right anyway. <laughs> Obviously, there's something else going on. Uh, but if something like this happens, then yeah, you're going to be fired because if you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing or if you're not improving, then they can let you go. Okay. And so that's the thing. That's when you have to worry because again, it's very expensive for organizations to hire coders. To hire a coder is a lot, guys. It's a lot of administrative work and administrative burden. And what I mean by administrative burden is the fact that when you are applying for a job as a coder and you go through the interview process and then they give you a test and somebody has to grade that test and then you have to talk about it in an interview or maybe they might say, well, hey, you failed this test. You're not getting an interview at all, you know. But if you do interview and it's not just you, there's other candidates. Okay, now we got to decide who we're going to pick from these candidates. Well, you know, this one scored really well, but this one scored even better, but this one didn't score enough. And, you know, but I really liked them as a person because they had a good personality and they could be trained and that kind of thing. So there's a lot of factors that go into that. Then you got to say, okay, well, we want to pick these two out of the three that interviewed. Okay, so we hire on these two. Now, here's the thing. This is what happens, guys. So once they decide they're going to give you an offer, right? So they got to get with HR. HR's got to draft the offer. Then they got to submit to you the offer. Then you say yay or nay, yay or nay, right? And then you have to go get a tinkle test done. You have to get a background check done. That's when they start doing all of that stuff, okay? And I'm going to talk about some things to be aware of for you um, new uh, medical coders out there when you're doing the job hunting process but I will just say this on this video they should never ask you for any part of your social security number before this happens before all of this uh, this um, acceptance and things like that if they're asking uh, you about this from jump street no no that's a scam because of the simple fact that they are not going to have any use for your social security number or your private information until after they agree because then that's when they're going to do the background check they will not do the background check before they meet with you before you do the auditing or not the auditing but the um the tests and things like that they are not going to do that background check beforehand because it costs money to do a background check they have to pay for these background checks and it's not just uh, the background check that they're doing but you also have to go and get fingerprints and do all of these things so it is a very in-depth process. It's not just, oh, you know, they're just hiring me. No, you have to go through the tinkle test. The tinkle test has to come back clean. Then you have to go get your fingerprints. Then you have to go get your driving record. <laughs> and then you got to get the background check. And then they have to go and call your, um, your what is it? Your, uh, your references. And so there's a lot of things that have to happen. And these things take time. And they also cost money. So again, uh, they're not going to do all these things and needing your private information until all of this other stuff happens first, okay? But that's going to be on another episode. I just want to make sure that I'm clear on this right now too because I want to say this because there's a lot of people that are getting taken advantage of and that should never happen. That should never happen, okay? Uh, but getting back to the auditing process. So when you're, when you're finishing up the audits and things like that and you agree and then now they've recorded all of your information um, and then that's telling them for your evaluations every month they're coming in with the audits and like okay they did good here uh, they did good here they had a dip here but they came back up and they recovered and you know they did really good and here's going to be their bonus okay or if you know whatever whatever they do um, but like I said they're not going to fire you just because you dip low for one month because it's so much money to get people hired they are going <laughs> to give you a chance um, and they're going to make sure a good company good organization will make sure that there's somebody that will help you and coach you along sometimes it's going to be the lead uh, medical coder sometimes it's going to be the auditors that are going to help you hey this person's kind of dipping low uh, we need to give them a hand and we need to kind of make sure that they're getting back on track because life happens and sometimes people just get distracted 
and they may not think about things like be present in the moment when they're actually coding because their mind is elsewhere. And if that's the case, a good manager is going to step in and find out, hey, how can I help? Because a good manager, good leader is going to look at their people and make sure that they set their people up for success. And I could get into a whole different conversation about that, but that's part of it. Okay. And so if you find yourself dipping low, also you as the coder have to say, wait a second, you know, my, my audit was really low. So I need to go back personally and not just wait for other people because this may or may not happen where somebody will come in and step in and say, Hey, you know, let's, let's help you out here. Let's find out what's going on. Why are you not understanding this? You also have to be an active part and play that active role into learning to, okay, what do I need to code here? Reviewing the guidelines, reviewing the chapter specific guidelines for your clinic. If you're, if you're in ortho, I always got to go back to ortho because ortho is one of those tough ones. Okay. If you're in ortho and you're reviewing the musculoskeletal section and you're reviewing the injury uh, section of those guidelines, that's going to really help you getting extra practice in, getting the workbooks and starting to go back through them again. There's no harm in it, especially when you're brand new or even if you're a veteran coder and you've never coded for a particular specialty before, that's what you should be doing. So that way your audits will never be low again. All right. And again, if you have something that's correct, then you need to speak up and tell that auditor. And if they get all flustered and mad and they start hollering, that's not that's not professional. That's not appropriate. And so if you have to say, Hey, I think we need to take a time out so that we can all just take a break. Uh, that's okay too. But you never want to go back and forth with the auditor because sometimes the auditor is so used to being right. And when somebody comes back and tells them, well, you know, wait a second, let's look at this here. It can be like shocking to that auditor, especially if the auditor is not evolved. And when I mean, when I say evolved, what I mean is that they have not done personal work on themselves where they can take constructive criticism because you can't just dish out constru constructive criticism all day and not expect some back if you're doing something wrong as the auditor. I'm going to leave it right there. <laughs> uh, but that's the thing that you guys have to know. It's not the end of the world if you fail an audit. All right. Um, but you also want to make sure that you don't rest on those laurels if your audit is really good. If you were able to uh, get a correction back from the auditor and now you've got a swelled head. That's wrong, too, because just as much as you did really good that month, you could really drop the ball next month. So our whole thing is to be consistent. You want to be consistently good. You want to be consistently correct. You want to hit for that consistent accuracy. That's what you want to hit for. And if something is troubling you, whether it is a sequencing, whether it is a procedure coding itself, then you do have to make the extra effort to learn more. No one is going to hold your hand through this process. That's this industry. Because again, every, every medical coder is going to come in with a unique level of education, a unique level of knowledge and, and, and other skills. And so because of that, coders are going to be varying strengths. And it may be that a coder may be strong in one area, but not so strong in another area, but somebody else is strong. That's why we are all a team. <laughs> That's how that works. And going through the audit process is no different. Okay. Now, when it comes to, you know, how you, you are audited and maybe you say, well, they, they marked me wrong, but they didn't mark um, the other person wrong. And I don't think that that's right. And playing favorites and blah, blah, blah. Obviously that is not correct. But again, if you are being professional, if you are showing your resources and your references, then you're going to be fine because you have knowledge on your side. You don't have, well, I'm going to play favorites. You never do that. Okay. But if you have knowledge on your side, you're going to be just fine. And like I said, when you are doing this, you want to shoot for that accuracy and you want to make sure that everything is correct. And if you're being told that you're wrong, you cannot take it personally. You cannot take it personally, no matter how your feelings about that auditor and you, because that's 
part of the human process too, is that we all have feelings about each other, but you should never allow that to cloud the way that you speak to somebody or the way that you treat that person. Because if you do, then that's when the learning stops and then it just becomes about ego. <laughs> and no, 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 we don't do that here. We don't do that here. You have to set your ego aside because it's not all about, oh, what you think. Because we all don't know everything. And I will say, I'll be the first one to admit, I am still learning. I don't know everything. I know a lot and my knowledge grows every day because that's a conscious choice that I make. Every single day is to learn something or to uh, get with my providers to talk to them so I can learn more about those conditions. That's something that I consciously do on a daily basis, you know, either war, right? And that's something that you have to do. But again, there are so many people, <laughs> they want the quick, I'm just here to collect a check and go home. And, you know, I'm not here to learn all that extra stuff. I don't want to have to put in all this other extra time on my own to learn. But it's beneficial to you, right? Because the more time that you put in, even off work hours where you're reading about something or you're learning about anatomy or you're learning about this or you're learning about that, anything that will contribute to you improving as a coder, that's going to make you work faster because everything's going to become easier to you. Again, if you learn the slow way, like Rick says from his channel, Think Like a Horse, uh, if you learn the slow way, the slow way is the fast way and you will improve and you will be better for it further on down the road. Okay. Uh, but like I said, audits are not personal. Do not take them personally. It's just something that's part of the job. It's part of the position that you're in. Okay. Um, but always make sure that you arm yourself with reputable resources. Make sure that when you are citing a resource, that you are citing it in a respectful way. If you're having to do written uh, rebuttals, make sure that you're very, um, you're very professional. You never want to say you. <laughs> Don't refer to that as the person is you. You said you, you know, no, no, no. You always cite the facts. It's about the facts. It's never you, you, you. It is, these are the facts. Okay, so just make sure you remember that. And again, not every, not every coder is going to get along with the auditor, but at the same time, if that auditor is a good auditor, they're going to turn this into a learning experience. And that's the way that you need to look at it too. And you have to respect the auditors for what they do. Um, and if you need to provide them education, doesn't matter how long you've been in the industry, because even people with a string of credentials don't know a hill of beans sometimes, okay? Uh, but if you have something to educate them on, they should be willing to listen to you, okay? But again, you have to work on how you are defending yourself, how you present yourself, and try to keep the emotions at a, you know, a little low there, <laughs> at a one. You don't want them at a 10, okay? Because that's not gonna help anybody. And if you need to, and if it's if it's so bad that you can't, you just need a timeout. Just tell them, hey, I need I need a timeout. Let me just can I just get a timeout? Um, because you're not going to want to continue a conversation when things get heated, because things may be said that can't be taken back. I'm just saying. So with that said, best of luck to you guys. It's it's a learning experience and. It is fun. Sometimes it is fun, especially when you get a really good auditor. <laughs> when you get a really good auditor, you you will you will learn things, okay? And sometimes they will learn from you as well. Okay, so with that said, I'm gonna wrap this one up. Thank you guys so much for joining me. If this video helped you, please like, subscribe, and share, and I'll see y'all again. Bye.